So now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Evan Meyer. Um, Evan comes from the East Coast, uh, all the way from Massachusetts. Um, he uh, had held positions previously at Harvard, although I don't remember what exactly he did there. And then um, the Native, Land, um, Native Plant Trust, which used to be the New England Wildflower Society, so he has a connection with native plants on the East Coast. Um, when he moved out to California, he took a position at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, was in charge of their seed conservation program, and then from there he moved over to um, UCLA to become the assistant director of the uh, Mildred Mathias Botanic Garden, and he's been there for a couple of years, but now I'm happy to announce that he just took on the um, executive director position at the Theodore Payne Foundation. This was his first week. If I'm not mistaken, so he's uh, um, new on the job, but he, um, here tonight, uh, carved into his uh, very hectic schedule, to give us a presentation about um, a trip that he took last year to South Africa, and so he'll be sharing um, some, of it, some of the things that he learned and saw on his travels and comparing the South African flora to California. So please welcome Evan Meyer. down a little bit. Uh, perfect. All right. So yeah, this is my third day of a new job. So if I get more into the stream of consciousness, like yeah, rambling that stuff, um, that's why. Bear with me, please. Um, tonight is going to be a tale of two floras. Um, and we already know it's California flora and the South African flora. Can, you, can anybody tell which one is which up here? No. No? It's a trick question because one is Mexico and the other one is, is actually uh, South Africa, but it's Baja California, Northwest Baja California. So floristically, it is California, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, how about these two? Anybody want to guess which is which? The wildflowers are the Cahuilla River drainage uh, in three rivers, and the shrub is, uh, is, is in South Africa. It's a polygola milkwort shrub, which are normally little tiny herbs that are, you know, the ones that we have uh, in North America. So we see giant shrubs, and they're, they're landscape plants here in California, too. Anyways, this is the rambling that I was hoping I wouldn't do. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about these two floors. I want to just stack them up side by side so we can look at them and think about them together. And then give a little behind the scenes peek of what it's like to be a botanist on the road. Um, and then why do we do it? Why do we travel as botanists and horticulturalists out into natural areas, and that I'm entitling Taming the Wild, and that's going to have some historical uh, perspective on, on uh, my current and former job. So, so here we go. So why, why should we do this comparison to begin with? Well, one reason is that the, uh, the city flower of Los Angeles is Strelitzia regini. Uh, Bird of Paradise, which is a South African native. And so South African plants are very much incorporated into the ornamental palette here in Southern California. Um, and that's because they do come from us, uh, we have a very similar climate basically to South Africa. In, in, if you walk through the city of um, Cape Town, it's very much like walking through, not so much LA, more like San Francisco. It's a little kind of cooler and wetter there, but the street trees in Cape Town would be the same ones you'd see in San Francisco. Um, and then out in the wild, the vegetation structure is very similar. So the plants are completely different, but it'll look very much the same. And we're going to see that side by side. Um, again, that's that ornamental palette. And the reason that I want to do this is because I think to really understand where you come from, your flora, your ornamental uh, horticulture, looking at the closest thing outside in the world can give you more perspective and a better uh, better understanding of how to utilize your own flora. So that's, that's kind of, that's why I sort of embarked on this, this project and thinking about these, these two parts of the world. So we'll jump right in and um, I do come from like an academic botanical garden background, so there's going to be some academic facts and figures and there will be a test. Um, <laughs> uh, but have you guys all heard of this concept of biodiversity hotspots before? No. no. So these are the parts of the world that have the highest levels of diversity of plant and animal species that are also under the most threat. And, and this is a really famous paper that was done oh, maybe 15 years ago or so. Um, 
that basically quantified the uniqueness of different parts of the world in terms of their biodiversity. And you can see a lot of it's in the tropics, but you can also see that we here in California are, thanks I don't have a pointer, um, are, are part of that biodiversity hotspot. And actually all five of the world's Mediterranean climates are biodiversity hotspots. So California, Chile, the Mediterranean basin of Europe, southwestern Australia, and uh, the Cape region of South Africa. So we're gonna drill down into these two places for the rest of the talk. And going a little further, people say Mediterranean climates, California is Mediterranean, South Africa is Mediterranean. That's kind of true, but it, it's much more nuanced than that, like everything. So here's a little breakdown, looking in more detail at these, uh, these two regions. What we consider the Mediterranean portion of, of, of uh, North America, it's called the California Floristic Province. It's not only in California, it also extends into Southern Oregon and down into Baja, California. So these are all basically, uh, I should go back and say that Mediterranean regions, I think this probably everybody knows this, but these are parts of the world that experience a very dry, hot summer and a mild, wet winter, and almost all the rainfall is gonna come in the winter in a true Mediterranean region. Um, so, so the California Floristic Province here, and then Adjacent to that is the Mojave Desert, which is a winter rainfall desert. And that's kind of interesting because in South Africa, you have a Mediterranean climate region that's also attached to a different winter rainfall uh, desert called the, the succulent Karoo, which is the, that gray area in South Africa. And the actual Mediterranean portion of uh, South Africa is that darker tip on the, on the bottom. And it, interestingly, most of the plants that are in the ornamental palette of Southern California, that are South African, are not Mediterranean. So they actually mostly come from Eastern South Africa and the summer rainfall regions, um, including uh, bird of paradise, natal plum, you know, the, the really common like street plant, you know, uh, ornamental plants are coming from not Mediterranean parts of South Africa. Um, one sort of interesting fact when we're comparing these two floras to look at is the way that they're classified. So scientists have a taxonomy of landscapes the way that botanists have a taxonomy of plants. So, you know, a botanist would say there's a species, a genus, a family, an order. There's a similar thing in a similar structure for classifying different landscapes. And they use a, a province, a floristic province, and the, the larger structure above that is the uh, region, and then above that is the kingdom. So in California, our, our floristic province that we're in, we have our own floristic province named for us, that's pretty cool. Um, part of the Madrian region, which is the uh, Madrian Cordillera, the mountains that come up from Mexico. So we're related, or floristically related to those mountains. And then that's part of the whole Arctic kingdom, floristic kingdom. That kingdom is like almost the entire Northern hemisphere. So we have a very unique flora in California, but it's like related to most of the Northern hemisphere. Contrast that to South Africa, which has its own province, the Cape region has its own province, its own floristic region, and its own floristic kingdom. So clearly a very unique and, uh, and interesting flora there. And if you look uh, and compare these areas side by side, you, um, you can see that the, the California floristic province is about three times bigger than the, the Cape region of South Africa. Um, but the Cape region in a third of the size has uh, almost twice the number of plants and almost double the amount of endemic plants. So endemic plants are plants that only occur in that one part of the world. So it is definitely a more diverse um, flora than the California flora. Um, and again, we're gonna, we're gonna compare and contrast here and then we'll see which, which flora ends on top at the end of this talk, but <laughs> hint, hint. Um, uh, there's a lot of people have like discussed why, why is South Africa so diverse compared to other Mediterranean climates and, and I think the leading kind of theories are that it's because it has this very old Mediterranean climate that's basically been stable for like 10 million years. Um, uh, versus in, in California, we've had a semi-stable Mediterranean climate that's been maybe two to five million years. So it just ha hasn't been as much time to evolve the diversity. There's a lot more to it than that's much more nuanced. Um, okay, so we've gotten through some of the background facts and figures. Now we have the pretty pictures coming up, but I wanna compare um, habitat types in these two regions and uh, talk a little bit about where, you know, what plants come out of them into horticulture. So we'll start in California um, with the coastal sage scrub. This is like the habitat most, you know, 
most often right on the edge of the coast, but not always. So, you know, sometimes you'll be 40 or 50 or 60 miles inland in, co in coastal sage scrub, and that always confuses people. But this is where um, California sage comes up, uh, California Ar Ar Artemisia californica. It's a beautiful, um, you know, fragrant, aromatic plants, and a lot of interesting horticultural plants are coming from this habitat type. Um, <coughs> something that is roughly equivalent, in, in, or you know, maybe could be thought of as similar as the fame boss of South Africa, which is also a, a kind of a low-lying shrub-dominated uh, landscape. And this is like the mecca. I, I talked about the diversity of different plants that you find in South Africa. This is where you um, will find some of the most showy, beautiful plants, the proteaceae, the proteas, and the leucospermums, and, and um, all of these wonderful, gorgeous plants. Um, well, we're going to get more into the, the kind of details and the nitty gritty of trying to cult cultivate these plants, but most of the fame boss is derived from sandstone, so it's pretty uh, it's pretty acidic, and it's super well drained. And if you actually ever walk through the fame boss after a fire, you can scoop up the soil like sand. It's almost like a sand dune. It's so sandy, so it's very different than the soils that are typical to, the, to the Cal Southern California. California, jumping back to a California habitat type, the chaparral. This is where many manzanitas or toyon, different species of ceanothus come from. This this type of landscape. I can attest to the fact that going out and doing field work in this habitat type is about as awful as any place you can, <laughs> you can do it in. Um, I've shredded shirts in half, I've cut myself up, I've lost a $300 GPS unit that got snagged on a, on a Cianothus and, and uh, was left behind. It's just very difficult, like, it's the impenetrable thicket, basically. And it superficially resembles the Rhinosterfeld, which is a habitat type of South Africa. But the difference, major difference being that chaparral tends to be mid elevations on slopes where Rhinosterfeld is a bottomland vegetation type. Um, and there's usually quite a bit of diversity of shrubs in the chaparral versus Rhinosterfeld. Almost all of the shrubs you see there are one species called the Rhinosterboss. Um, Anybody want to guess why it's called rhinosteros? <laughs> well, it looks like a rhinoceros. Apparently, there's no rhinoceros. Do not live in the rhinosteros, but um, it's gray like a rhinoceros, so they name name it the rhinosteros. But this this is like I said, a very rich kind of bottomland uh, habitat type, and um, because of that, it's super threatened because it's the best agricultural land in the country. So they've um, uh, converted many, much of it to agriculture. But it's also the center of diversity of bulbs. So all the wonderful South African bulbs that collectors grow, not all of them, but a, a substantial portion derived from, from this habitat type, the, the rhinosterfeld. Now getting into something that we have that there really isn't an equivalent of in South Africa is the conifer forest. We have higher elevations in California than they do in South Africa. And, the, and one thing that we are much more diverse in um, in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere Mediterranean climates are conifers. Um, and of course, California, we have the world's tallest conifer, the world's most massive conifer, and the world's oldest conifer. So we'll tick that in the box of the California flora above South Africa. Um, there, are, there are some conifers in South Africa, I think three, three native species. And this is one that's a very rare one called uh, Widringtonia. Uh, Wallichia, the, what they call the Clan William Cedar. We'll go back to this. We're cultivating this at, at UCLA, or we, we at Bay, I guess now. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a beautiful tree and super rare. Um, you can sometimes find seeds for sale, and if anyone wants to grow one in their garden, this would be the one to have because it's just like there's very few of them that exist anywhere in the world. Now, I talked about that winter rainfall uh, desert of, of California, the Mojave Desert. Um, obviously here, you know, totally beautiful, many different succulents. I'm really interested in, in looking more closely at the Eastern Mojave Desert for cultivating in Los Angeles because the, there's just some wonderful plants there that um, seem to be pretty easy to cultivate in my experience, but, but the, the ones that I've tried to grow have, have been pretty adaptable to an urban climate. 
they also can take summer water much better than some of the inland, or the, sorry, the coastal natives. The equivalent in South Africa is the, um, it is what they call the succulent Karoo. And this is a huge region that's just incredibly diverse. And you can see all the different ice plants and asters and things. And I want to drill down to one specific uh, habitat type within um, the succulent Karoo, which is the, what they call the Canaris flecta. And this means the gnashing of teeth. Um, and they called it that because um, because wagons would drive over this uh, ground. It's this like compacted quartzite sort of pebbles. That it's almost like this asphalty kind of landscape. And when the wagons, you know, back in the in the settler days, um, would drive over, it sounded like teeth gnashing. But it's you know, it looks sort of like okay, it's this white pebble landscape. So what? Um, but if you look closely, can people see? I wish I had a pointer here. You see all those little little baby living stone plants. There. This is where all of those crazy little collector's items um, come from. So you see all those little, you know, it's all covered. Anybody see all these? There's an amazing diversity in there of, of these little, little tiny baby succulents that are just so beautiful and cute. And here you can see a close up of one of them. Just many, many different types. And I could, have, I could do a whole talk just on this. It's just such an amazing uh, habitat type. I'm going to be bad and show an insect photo, or not, a non-plant photo right now. Can anybody see it? I just snapped that when I was there. Like, what an amazing mimicry to that. I, I think it's some sort of a grasshopper. Or something, I don't know. Um, but it, it look, it's got the coloration of the quartzite. It's just incredible. Okay, so those are, this is like a, an overview of some of the just like the major habitat types. There's much more in both parts of the world. I'm giving like the quick and dirty cliff notes version of, of these floras. Um, and we'll jump next to the charismatic megaflora, aka very cool plants. Um, That's cute. The first one is not even a plant unto its own. It's a, it's a phenomenon that happens, which is our super bloom, you know, mass blooms of annual plants. This was the Death Valley Super Bloom in 2016. Of course, um, the Carrizo Plain last year was just absolutely phenomenal. And I remember reading an article that NASA was photographing the Super Bloom from space, um, which is pretty cool. South Africa gets them too, so we can't claim the Super Bloom. They do get massive, major Super Blooms there that are totally amazing. Um, but I've never heard of anyone photographing them from space, so maybe we can claim them. <laughs> so the, the diversity of geophytes and bulbs is amazing in both parts of the world. Here in California, um, there's a lot of rare and unusual bulbs. We'll be selling a bunch, actually, coming up at our, you know, this spring, there's some really neat ones we have in cultivation. Um, I don't know if we've done this one before. Uh, Munza's iris, this is one from the um, Southern Sierra Nevada, really beautiful iris. South Africa has some really funky bulbs and bulb relatives. This is one called Witsenia maura, which is a um, what they call a woody iris. So it's actually <coughs> almost like a shrub-like uh, species and just totally funky. There's only one person that I know of in the world who's cultivated this, and he's here in California, Martin Grantham, uh, up in San Francisco. And uh, Everybody in, in South Africa knows him as a grower because he's such a good grower of South African plants here in California. So there's this definitely this horticultural exchange that a lot of the great growers of South African plants are here in California. Um, you don't see a lot of people cultivating California plants in South Africa. A few, there are a few invasive plants from California that grow in South Africa, but um, we've, you know, our horticultural the South Africans have enough to focus on with their native flora, and we, we as sort of, you know, explorers have gone and uh, combed the South African flora. So a lot of the great growers of South African plants actually are here in California. Uh, the Joshua tree, totally iconic California plant. You two wrote an album about it, um, and when you drive to to Las Vegas, you'll you'll pass by, you know, groves of it, and it's like you're entering the Mojave Desert when you see this plant. Well, there's sort of a, an equivalent um, of the 
quiver tree, which um, uh, which is a you know a similar uh, kind of effect when you're driving north through up towards Namibia, you'll see the quiver tree. And I, there's a, a place called the Coker Bloom Nursery um, that sells <coughs> quiver trees. Um, you can buy a full size quiver tree, and they'll put it on a shipping crate and ship it to you on a freight liner. Um, which is amazing that they can do that. They can pull it out of after six weeks on the ocean and revive it, and you can put it in your front yard. Um, I, I, when I heard about that, it just blew my mind, and I was like, man, this must be like really expensive. Anybody, anybody want to guess how expensive that that would be? $1,000. That's what I thought. Now, they told me it would be $3,000. No. Like, oh, okay. Amazing um, succulents in both places. So the stone crop family, Dudleya, Passiflora, endemic to the mountains in Baja, Baja, California. The butter tree, I have a great story about this, but I don't know how much, how I'm doing on time, so maybe I'll, yeah, okay. Okay, so the butter tree, Tylocodon paniculatus. I, um, I have a theory about, about um, the naming of plants in South Africa. This is called the Boterboom in Afrikaans. Af really quick. Af the Afrikaans people are, they were Dutch people who kind of went out as pioneers into a very harsh landscape. And unlike Americans like the, who came and we kind of kept a connection to the UK, to, to England, and are, are kept the language, the Trek Boers left Holland completely and they lost the language. They developed their own language, Afrikaans, which is kind of a pidgin language. And they were just out living in this, you know, very, scrappy existence, these thin soils, very low nutrients. And they have a lot of plants like the, the, but, the butter boom, the, the butter tree, the, the speck boom, the bacon bush. And um, I think that they were just walking through the desert and they saw this and they're like, oh, it looks like a stick of butter. So they're just like starving, so they named all their plants after. So, uh, that's my personal theory, but somebody told me that they called the butter boom because Children, the Trek board children would cut these down and sled sled on them, use them to sled down the hills because they're kind of slick and slippery. And this is a, a pretty common kind of collector's item in the succulent world, and they're really pretty. And they, they get to be about this big. They're really common in the landscape in South Africa. Um, okay, getting to the the manzanitas, one of the most diverse and beautiful groups of shrubs uh, here in California, and they're uh, they're very you know, subtle. They come out in the spring and they have these beautiful, supple, bell-shaped flowers and sculptural red uh, red bark and these beautiful upright leaves. And they're kind of contrasted by the almost gaudy, fluorescent ericas of South Africa. And, um, you know, this very bright, you know, in-your-face fluorescence. And that's sort of one of the take-homes of the South Africa flora to me is you get things like the sugar bush with these just giant cone flowers. These, the, the diversity of mesons, which almost don't look real, they're so fluorescent. Um, Marsh pagoda, you get the, the incredible um, structural you know, foliage of plants like this Boafini distica, Osseospermum corymbosum, um, bright in your face colors of, of uh, this Uriops resin bush. And so I spent three weeks in South Africa, was guided by a local. Um, there are a couple locals there, and, but one of them, uh, Stuart Hall, who I think some of you guys know, he was our, our main guide, and he came back to California. I repaid the favor and took him around for three weeks here in California. And as I was planning the trip, I was thinking like, man, this is the floor that he grew up, grew up in. Like he loves, you know, he, he's seen the most amazing super blooms and proteus, and I was like, is it, is it gonna be good enough for him? <laughs> I was kind of worried. <laughs> and um, one of the first trips, it, I, he came on a good year. He came on 2019, so he came on Super Bloom year. And we went to the Southern Sierra Nevada, and um, and found a hill of uh, the silver bush lupin blooming with poppies and turtlenecks <coughs> and and all sorts of you know wildflowers. And I and then we went up and saw the giant sequoias. And um, I was like, no, we're fine. <laughs> and um, he, he agreed, and then we, we basically, we high-fived, and we just said, both of our floors are really cool. We live in awesome places, and, and that was sort of, that's where we settled. They're both amazing, and um, n neither is better than the other. They're both just fat, fantastic, stunning places. Okay, so a little bit of behind the scenes of what it's like to be a botanist on the road. You go to weird, funky shacks like this, 
Um, you might get your truck stuck every once in a while. Well, what are you, what are we actually doing out there? Well, sometimes you're there's stuff like this, which is uh, a photographer who was making a book on plants, and he had this whole mobile photography rig, uh, which was pretty cool. But usually, when I go out, I'm I'm there to collect seeds and to bring new plants into cultivation. So here's an example. This is a uh, milk vetch from from the dunes in Baja, California. And this is what the process looks like. It's not the most glamorous work. You're just sitting on your hands and knees, like picking seeds off plants for hours on end. But you get a pretty nice place to do it, like this, this dune system in Baja. Here's the, uh, the happy collector. This is Bart O'Brien, some of you guys probably know, collecting Lycium brevipes. And you can see um, the fruits of our labor for this particular trip, which was, I think, 2013, um, at Rancho Santa Ana, where they're growing now in the Baja Garden. So we actually have tried to bring bring these uh, specimens back, track all that material, and have a scientific kind of record of biodiversity that then can be studied, viewed, shared. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the goal. And that's, you know, we might find weird mutant forms like this crested burger cactus, and then take that back and have a new cultivar, a new sort of mutant. But what do we do in, in, our, in our downtime? Um, when you look at wildflowers all you know all day, and that's your job. Well, you you go look for seashells. <laughs> uh, so the trips that I've gone have, gone on have always been like as budget as possible. This is this is our South Africa trip. There's uh, seven guys in an eight passenger van. We have Martin Smith from the Amsterdam Botanical Garden, Tom Huggins from UCLA, um, Jeff. So the guy in the middle, I'll get to in a second. Um, Jeff Lynch, who's from Chanticleer Garden on the East Coast, Andrew Bunting was then Chicago Botanic Garden, now in, in Philadelphia, and then that's Stuart in the back. The guy in the middle um, was a guy named David Gwynn Evans, also known as the Naked Botanist. Um, he likes to recite poetry about wildflowers naked in, in what they call the veld, which is the field. So he goes out into the desert and recites poetry uh, in the nude. Uh, but he's an amazing person. He's hilarious. And he has a PhD in botany, so... <laughs> uh, the, oh, by the way, we destroyed this vehicle. I mean, it was three weeks of just driving it for, I think, like 3,000 miles, and, like, it was just basically falling apart when we finished this trip. I feel really bad for the rental car company. But we, we were just on rugged off-roads, and, you know, not, the hygiene wasn't as great as it could have been. <laughs> Oh, mumbling to himself. <laughs> I'm actually trying to get him a, a, a TV deal. That's how good he is. <laughs> uh, the packing of this vehicle was was amazing. Every every morning we had to uh, basically our day was we would wake up, pack the vehicle, drive for like two to three hours, get to the field site, be out all day, drive another couple hours, get home, clean seeds sleep for maybe five hours and then do it just over again every day. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for anything, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> so what do you eat on these trips? You eat what the locals eat, in this case an ostrich egg, um, which is the equivalent of about two dozen chicken eggs. <laughs> and it fed seven hungry, uh, field-weary gentlemen and we had a bunch of leftovers. So. And then this is how Gwen Evans eats. He's one of these guys who does not use plates or utensils. He just would take the pot when everyone else had taken their food and use the spatula to eat it. That tells you a lot about him. Um, you have injuries from time to time. This is Tom Huggins from UCLA. And when you have an injury in your career, the first thing you want to do is take a picture of it and text it to their wife. <laughs> Which is what we did immediately. <laughs> And then we went and said he's fine, it's just a flesh wound, he's so fine. But um, this actually was a really crazy canyon that we went down, and, and Dave, the naked botanist, Dave Gwynn Evans, led us down it, and he was like, oh, it's fine, I've been here before. He had not been there before, and it was just a straight drop into this canyon. But we found some really cool plants at the bottom, so it was worth it. Um, you can visit gardens and find new inspiration, and, and um, this, to me, this is like the, the Victorian curio shop 
mad scientist <laughs> bone collection, uh, which totally speaks to my aesthetic. And I texted this picture to my wife, and she was like, ugh, no, no way. <laughs> I like putting bones in our home garden, and she's not really into it. Um, but the ultimate goal is to bring back scientific vetted collections of biodiversity that, that can then be utilized. So this is just a small sampling of the things we collected on that trip. There's that really rare cedar that I was talking about, various succulents, and if you go to UCLA now, there's just tons of plants growing, um, some really amazing things. So jumping back to, um, to your home garden, you might be wondering, like, can you combine, can you combine South Africa and California in your garden? And I, I think yes, you can. But if you want, really want to bring in the true Mediterranean stuff, which is the goal, because then you'd have your native Californian plants, which are Mediterranean. They only want to be watered in the winter, and you'd have your Mediterranean and South African plants, which only be, only want to be watered in the winter. You bring them together, and everybody's happy, right? Not so easy because the the Mediterranean and South African plants, as I said, the soils are so different. They're very actually difficult to cultivate here, and it's it's a big issue of soil pH and soil structure. Um, but and it, it can be hard to find. But this is something that we're trying to to work on at UCLA. So there's a study going on to micro target very specific regions of South Africa that have that same climate that we have, but also have um, soils that are much more similar to, to California soils. So there's an area called the limestone feinbos, which are more alkaline soils that are a little more clay. And the hope is that some of those, the plants from those areas, they also have those big showy proteas and, and, and uh, succulents and things like that. Those might be a, a little bit more adapted to being combined into, in a California native garden. And so that's the hope. And so I want to end here um, talking about my new job. So this is uh, Theodore Payne and Mildred Mathias, so, which I was happy to see. And I want to thank Lily for getting this photo for me. Um, another angle, this is Mildred was, the, I guess, the keynote speaker in the dedication of the Theodore Payne uh, Wildlife Sanctuary. Wildlife Sanctuary. So to me, um, oh, very nice. <laughs> Um, there's been a, a, an exchange between the, the people like Theodore Payne who were really promoting and representing California native plants and the people who are promoting just general ornamental horticulture like Mildred and Matthias. And um, that's something that I hope to continue in, in my new role. And I also want to just shine a light on some of the people and the things that are happening at Theodore Payne that are very much in this, this vein. So here's uh, Jenny Arnold collecting seeds by the Hollywood sign, and, and this is that local source initiative that, that Lily was talking about, which is such a, an amazing thing to be able to buy a plant and know exactly where it came from. So it's taking that scientific ethic of collecting and tracking data that was very much a botanical garden thing and applying it to everybody and saying, you can all take part of this um, preservation of biodiversity and you can all have a vetted scientific collection in your garden, which is a really unique thing and it's something that it's only been possible in the retail world for a short time, so I'm really proud that that's something we're doing. Um, that's the local source. Then we, of course, are always trying to bring new and unusual stuff in. Here's Tim Becker, our director of horticulture, um, collecting some seeds. I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. It looks like a, a lotus of some sort, maybe. And the, the goal is to get to this, where you're actually bringing them back and recultivating them. So here's Flora Ito, who many of you um, may know, who, uh, in, our, in our sales yard at TPF, with uh, Facilia grandiflora and the fire poppy here. So they were actually able to go after the burns, collect seeds, bring them back to Theodore Payne, bulk them out, and have, you know, have basically be utilizing the wild and bringing it to diversify the human landscape, which I think is a really beautiful thing. And I want to end on a story about that that involves Theodore Payne himself. Here he is with the Ramnea Poppy. We think this might be his introduction, Romney White Clouds. I'm not sure, but um, so the story with Theodore Payne. How many of you guys are familiar with Nevin's Barberry? Okay, so some of you. It's a really beautiful native shrub. Here it is growing in the San Francisco Canyon. This is kind of what it looks like in its habitat. Um, but this photo doesn't really do it justice, but, it, but it's a plant that many 
spot in the snow because it's an extremely rare barberry, um, pretty easy to cultivate, very showy, beautiful berries. Theodore Payne was always going into the wild to, um, to, to look for the next plant to bring into horticulture, to, to diversify people's home gardens and to give them you know, more interest and more, uh, more opportunity to, to have a beautiful garden. And here's the original slip, um, a very rare species introduced to horticulture by Theodore Payne, specialist in California flowers and native plants. Um, so going back to this, uh, this wild canyon of the, of the barberry here, um, San Francisco Canyon, or was it wild? Because here's a, here's a, a letter from Theodore Payne to <coughs> Dr. Howard McMahon. He says, I have it in my mind for quite a while to write you regarding a statement in your book, A Manual of California Shrubs. On page 129, you give Berberus Nivinia is growing in San Francisco Canyon. Well, it happens that these are some that I planted in the spring of 1929. <laughs> so, so there you have the, the wild to the garden, back to the wild, fooling the, the spotness who studies the wild. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I put this as a last little thing to, to think about is, what is wild and cultivated anymore? We live in a world that we really are controlling and dominating in ways that uh, that you know, no species ever has before. And we, we really have a hand in, in the way that we shape our planet and the plants and the animals that live here. And we can make choices about how, uh, how we do that. So what, I, I ask you to just ponder this when you're driving home. What is wild and what is, what is tame? And so a few take home messages of, of the talk tonight. First one is you should all go to South Africa. Um, if you love California native plants, you'll love South African native plants. Um, very similar. We should be very proud of our flora here. It's an amazing, amazing flora that is one of the best in the world. No, actually, scratch that. It is the best in the world. <laughs> um, be ready to experiment in your garden. That's what gardening is all about. It's trying things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. Um, taking the wild home, this is something that I just love as an aesthetic. Like. And it's not for everybody, but for me, my favorite gardens are the ones that recreate nature and have boulders and, and beautiful shrubs that are you know, contrasting and, and perennials. Um, and really the, the drop tolerant plants are the future for Southern California, and they're probably the most important thing um, that we can be working on is, is moving towards plants that are totally in sync with the rainfall and the seasons that, that we have here. Um, I want to end with some what I consider sage advice from both the East Coast, where I started my career in, in horticulture and botany, and the West Coast, where, where I ended up. So on the East Coast, this is something that I, I heard from Bill Kalina in a talk. He's a famous horticulturist there, native plant horticulturist. And I heard uh, Mike Evans say almost the exact same thing here, the owner of Tree of Life, Mike Evans, uh, for a SoCal court talk that he did, a, a, I guess it was about a year ago. Um, and they both said, you know, grow native, grow as many, you know, your garden should be a native garden. We, that's what we do, we promote native plants. They're really important.